Good evening, everyone. It's our distinct pleasure um, to start uh, this event with all of you here tonight. And my name is Lillian Abo. I'm going to be moderating this session. I'm a professor of infectious diseases at the University of Miami, and also the Associate Chief and Medical Officer for Infectious Diseases at Jackson Health System. Um, I'm going to be introducing the faculty and just giving you some housekeeping uh, for tonight. Please make sure you are using your QR codes to enter your questions. We're going to be having we're webcasting and we have some live audience joining us tonight as well, uh, which are all welcome. And we want to make sure if you have any questions in the end, we're going to have enough time for Q&A and making this interactive. This is a very interactive session. We want to make sure that you come out of here learning something new and also that we have a great conversation and exchange of ideas. So if you are here, you're in the best practice in diagnosing upper respiratory infections in primary care. If you came to the wrong session, just stay here. You're going to have a great time. <laughs> yeah, the other session's not that good, trust me. <laughs> So um, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce our faculty today. I'm joined by Dr. Lily Lee and Dr. Chalk Vega. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, good evening. Welcome. And thank you for joining us for this evening. Um, my name is Lily Lee. I'm the Chief of Emergency Medicine at Jackson Memorial Hospital. I'm also the Division Chief of Emergency Medicine at the Department of uh, Surgery at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. And uh, I'm Chuck Vega. I'm a clinical professor of family medicine at the University of California at Irvine, where I also serve as assistant dean for culture and community education and director of UC Irvine's signature program of medical education for the Latino community. You were asking me about titles. And uh, actually, at UCI, uh, they give out titles in lieu of pay. So <laughs> there you are. <laughs> That's academia. <laughs> All right. Um, just um, some housekeeping. The policy of Medscape is to avoid mention of brand names or specific manufacturers um, in educational activities. However, for the purposes of these meeting, we have some brand names of some of the testing products, not to uh, promote anyone in particular, but it's more for clarity so you can come out understanding what are the differences between the panels and the manufacturers. So let's get started, and I know some of you are eating, but we want to make this a little bit interactive. There's a lot of audience response. So we first want to know who's here in the room with us. So please, up. Oh, let me see. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so which uh, respiratory infections are you currently seeing in your practice? And please select all that apply. You know, a few years ago, we wouldn't really even know. It would just be a lot Some of infections, virus. and now, now we are <laughs> distinguishing much more. And I think that was always part of your world, Lillian, but it, yes. it, you know, it's definitely in the primary care space now. It's everywhere, every space. Okay, so hmm. we're still in 2023, so 42% of you are still seeing SARS-CoV-2, which, again, we're, we're seeing in different parts of the, of the country. Mm -hmm. um, flu. And then RSV, yes, yeah, seems to be increasing. Mm -hmm. Not much pertussis and some per influenza. Very good. Let's go with the next question. So the next question is, who are your patients? Are you mostly peds, adults, geriatrics, or 
all at the same time? Please pick your answer. And Chuck, your practice is a mix, and Lily, you see mostly. Lily's primarily adults, but adults. Uh, we do have yeah. pediatric nurses in the department. Yeah. And yeah, this actually yeah. this is actually okay. very reflective of my practice. It's <laughs> right down the line. I've become a functional geriatrician. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get started, yep. and uh, I'm going to pass the baton yeah, to sounds good. Dr. Vega. So this is really cool. It's a real honor to be with you today and with such great speakers, and we're going to mix it up and uh, you know, hopefully you know, keep the arguments and, and fisticuffs down to a minimum, because we're into, it's all case-based. That's almost all case-based, so you will be using your audience response quite a lot tonight, and uh, that should make it, I think, really interesting, engaging, and it'll help it stick. Um, after you leave tonight. So I'm going to present case one. It is a six-year-old girl brought by her father to the urgent care center. Two-day history of malaise, uh, attempt to 39-1 last night, got better with ibuprofen, wet cough and rhinorrhea for two days, but no dyspia, no GI symptoms, normal oral intake. <clears throat> father says, yeah, colds are going around in her school, but doesn't have a particular sick contact. Um, and very importantly, and kudos to you for knowing this, that you know that SARS-CoV-2, RSV, and influenza, you know, some of the big three in terms of viral uh, uh, infections that could, that could affect this six-year-old are going around your community. So it really is important, particularly when we're moving into flu and RSV season, to have some idea, and as local as you can, um, what, kind of, um, what kind of infection rate is going on. Uh, unfortunately, without it, your, your pretest probability gets a little skewed. So that's a very strong point in your history. Well done, everybody. Um, and uh, she's otherwise healthy. And another great thing to ask about vaccines, predicting, you know, maybe we know that the COVID vaccine, the flu vaccine, uh, they're not for perfect in terms of prevention of infection, but they can certainly prevent her from having a more severe infection. And so we get a good vaccine history as well. She has three COVID vaccines and a flu vaccine. So here are the suspects in terms of, uh, you know, what I would think about my differential, and it's pretty broad. Uh, so you really have, you know, at this point, she has a nonspecific viral upper respiratory infection, and I would think it's viral. It's certainly more likely to be viral, but can I say absolutely based on this thumbnail case that it's, back, that it's not bacterial? No. So we still have to uh, figure those um, infections in as well. And so, and we have seen uh, a lot of crazy things over the past few years. Um, we saw a huge spike in RSV during the summer of 2021 that primarily affected uh, the Midwest. Uh, last year, we saw an influenza outbreak right now, like, and actually it started in early October. Um, that was very unusual. Usually, influenza typically will begin um, to really rise up after Thanksgiving, uh, approximately. You get together, you eat a bunch of turkey and overeat, and then you infect everybody, and they all fly home and infect their friends and coworkers. Um, so, uh, so very unusual. High rates of hospitalization last year as well due to RSV and influenza. So we are still, I think, trying to kind of find the rhythm and the pattern, although the pattern, as we're, we're going to discuss how that, uh, how that looks graphically in a minute. What do you two think, I'm going to pull you in on this one, um, about differentiating um, the RSV from influenza and COVID-19 based on a, you know, it's an outpatient setting, a six-year-old girl or a 36-year-old woman, doesn't really matter, differentiating these different viruses based on clinical ground symptoms and um, physical exam alone? So I think we've all been fooled um, because you may be very certain that it's one thing and it's another, unless you really know what's circulating in the community. So 2020, we know what was circulating most of the time was COVID-19. We were barely testing for any other viruses. Yes, you can have some times for infection, but um, I think it's important to know what's circulating in the community and is this child going to school? Does she have little siblings? I'm sorry. I yeah. She's that, she, she has control of her voice. It, it, yeah, I have yeah, control of my voice in the microphone. <laughs> I don't know why it is uh, doing that. Um, so what, what we really want to make sure is that you understand that sometimes it's really hard just by, a, just by a physical exam and a history to know exactly which virus the patient has. Um, we know that in younger children, perhaps RSV is more prevalent, but we have seen severe cases of RSV in adults lately. Mm -hmm. And the same with influenza and SARS-CoV-2, very similar symptoms, although we have seen more conjunctivitis with COVID-19 that we, we don't routinely see conjunctivitis with RSV and influenza, the loss of sense of smell that we have seen with SARS-CoV-2, and the GA symptoms that any of these viruses can have GA symptoms, but we saw a significant amount with right. COVID and sometimes with influenza. 
so. Yeah, particularly in kids, they're more likely to have GI symptoms. But there's a, there, that's a great point, thank you. They, and there have been studies that actually looked at both adults and kids and looked at the clinical presentation. And really the conclusion was you can't discriminate alone based on, um, uh, based on their presentation, that all of these viruses have to be in play until you get testing. And we're gonna talk a lot about testing. But first, let's talk a little bit more about epidemiology. And I think we'll hand it back to you. Yeah, so, so what you can see in this graph is this is showing between 2019 and 2022 what were the viruses circulating in our communities. And do you want me to change microphones? OK, thank you. Can you hear me better? Now you can sing. Okay. That's a, yeah, yeah. You don't want to hear look. me singing. <laughs> I can <laughs> So in 2019 and early 2020, if you can see in the left side of the graph, multiple colors, right? There were multiple viruses circulating, especially influenza A, influenza B, um, some adenoviruses. Uh, we see in teal color some seasonal coronaviruses. But, you know, what shift in 2020 was the pandemic of SARS-CoV-2, and that's in dark green. And then you also start seeing more rhinoviruses. And why was that? Well, we know that everybody was masking. We were in lockdown. So what was really being transmitted for the most part, all, the kids were out of school. There was not too many daycares were, you know, opened. So we know that we had more control, and there was just one virus that pretty much took over. What has happened, you know, late 2022 and now early 2023 is we're now seeing again a resurgence of all these viruses that some people were never exposed uh, for, for some time. And now we're seeing an increase again in, in more respiratory viral infections and some of them even more severe. So what's going on right now in 2023? What you can see in the left side of the graph is, you know, last October, November, same thing, early fall, early uh, winter, we start seeing an increase of influenza and RSV. We are from Florida. So Miami in particular has something very interesting and, and RSV is, is, is seasonal throughout the year. We don't have a season of RSV. It's pretty much endemic all year round. So even in the summer, we always say that the summer is our winter because summer is when people go indoors with air conditioning. The winter is when we go outdoors because we can finally you know, breathe. So um, what we typically see is in, in depending on where you are in the country, your influenza season may start sooner and your RSV season may be continuous. But now again, since September, we're starting to see again, maybe the kids are back to school, people are traveling again, and we're seeing some rise in SARS-CoV-2 again. And in many places, people are going to meetings like we're going here, and then when they come back home, a few people may come back with some respiratory viral infection. So going back to you, Chuck. Yeah, yeah, so let's uh, go back to our case of our six-year-old. So father says, I just want somebody to help ease your symptoms. It's a very typical and particularly maybe father thing to say. Uh, you tell him that you have access to point of care and send out multiplex tests for respiratory pathogens. And so now get your devices ready again because you're gonna answer this question. You'll see this qu these, uh, these choices a few times. Uh, what is the best course of action now? Symptomatic control only with instructions on appropriate monitoring of her URI. Um, how about a rapid antigen test for influenza only or a short panel multiplex PCR test? If you're not sure what that is, don't worry. It'll be explained shortly. A laboratory-based extended multiplex <coughs> respiratory panel. Presumptive treatment with anti-influenza drug or presumptive treatment for COVID-19. What do you think? Let's see what you'll do. There, and for a lot of these questions, there isn't necessarily a right answer. And it also has to do, gosh, what resources do you have in your practice? Do you have point of care testing? Do you have to do send out testing? So let's see where you're at. Okay, so we have a mix. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's perfectly reasonable. So, <coughs> and it looks like we're really focused on uh, doing the symptomatic control or the short panel uh, multiplex, but also there's a there's some for the uh, multi the extended uh, send out um, multiplex respiratory panel, and not not much support for presumptive treatment with uh, with drugs. So yeah, absolutely, I think that that's I think that that's a reasonable course. And so the key question here, and I think we'll come back to it in different ways, because we all actually have a slightly different take on mm -hmm. this, is. How is the testing going to change our management? I think those of you who selected option one, you know, said so it's not really going to change our management. She's six years old. She's not, it doesn't seem to be at high risk of, of you know, complications from these infections. Um, and, so, and so therefore, symptomatic, and they want symptomatic care. So of course, we're going to give symptomatic care as best we can. I always say that the, uh, the individual who solves the problem of pediatric snot deserves like three Nobel Prizes. I will personally <laughs> send them a check. Uh, 
because yeah, it just takes one night around 3 a.m. with a, your kid in the shower, like trying to mm -hmm. trying to get the mucus out. Uh, like yeah, it's like this is ridiculous. We need better pharmaceuticals. So I think it's reasonable. I would think that for her case, who lives with her, and what are we going to do about isolation? What are we going to do about getting her back to school? Um, those are priorities, and testing there will make a difference. That's what I'm going to leave it. I'll leave it up for now, but let's get back to uh, the types of testing we could do. Excellent. So when we're dealing with respiratory infections, there are different ways of thinking. The traditional methods, the limited, and the syndromic multiplex. And if we go back to the previous question, one of the answers was rapid antigen. And I saw that maybe 1% actually answer rapid antigen. And that is actually correct. In the past, when we don't have these PCR panels, influenza antigen was probably what was mostly used. The sensitivity is really bad. It's 20% at most. So we don't really recommend influenza antigen testing. What we have seen with SARS SARS-CoV-2 was a bit of a paradigm shift. We saw antigen testing, point of care, and people would be able to go to the pharmacy or get the antigen delivered home. And I think the future of medicine is going to be shifting now with artificial intelligence, with telehealth, and a lot of resources. We're going to start seeing perhaps more at-home testing. So we don't need to send the patient to the ER unless they really need to, or wait in line in the urgent care center. And you may be able to take care of your patients in your family medicine practice, perhaps ordering testing and seeing them, and just bring to the office the people that really need a physical exam and more care. So traditionally, we know that culture still exists, and the problem with viral cultures, it takes time, and the viral media is sometimes a little hard to grow. So cultures can take three to five days. The sensitivity is not as good as with some other methods, but in some places, it's still the only thing that you have available. Antigen testing, we, as, as we just mentioned, variable uh, performance depending on the test for SARS-CoV-2, for influenza, antigen testing has not been great. And then we have the single-plex PCR. That's a PCR just for influenza or just for SARS-CoV-2 or just RSV. Most of these tests are harder to find as most of the companies have bundled the testing, right? Because what do you do if the influenza test is negative? Now you need to swap the patient again and then do another test and then, you know, keep swabbing. And it's not fun. If any of you had the COVID swabs for PCR, you know, you probably felt it in your brain. So limited multiplex PCR, um, we have the duplex, the triplex, and these typically test for the most common viruses, influenza A and B. And RSV. And then you have the syndromic, which is more broader. And again, we have the shorter and the longer panels, but in these ones, we're talking in this case with the, with the shorter panel, which they combine. And then if we're going to do syndromic, they also have some bacterial coverage. So what are some of the upper respiratory panel examples? We have the first one is BioFire. This one is testing for five viruses, SARS-CoV-2, rhinovirus, flu A and B, and RSV and their turnaround time is about 15 minutes. Then the BDMAX panel um, tests similar viruses except rhinoviruses, and it takes two to three hour turnaround time. And then the third one is the Cepheid Expert, which actually tests for, um, in 25 minutes all four uh, viral pathogens, and you can also, if, for SARS-CoV-2 it's actually 25 minutes, but if you want the four viral panel, it's 36 minutes. So the main difference here is some of the panels have rhinovirus, some do not. And then the cost and the turnaround time is going to be different. So you really need to tailor the test to what do you have in your practice. For many of us, it's really what the hospital contracts with. Depends on which instrument the lab already has, the cost of their reagents. And sometimes we as infectious disease experts, we do have a saying and we work with the lab in trying to determine which one is the most cost effective panel for us. So we really want to look at several things. We want to look at cost for the patient, the coverage from the insurance, the reimbursement for the hospital. But also we want to look at the turnaround time and how much hands-on the, the laboratory has to put into place to actually deliver. Sometimes it's 15 minutes and everything is automated, and sometimes people have to be pipetting things with their hands, which takes a significant amount of time. So um, before we move to the next, which, which test do you typically see in your practices, Dr. Lee? Uh, we actually uh, use the uh, short multiplex PCR often, uh, and occasionally for the uh, sicker patients, we do the extended uh, multiplex panel. But again, a lot of these tests are dependent on what the uh, laboratory in the hospital has offer, right? And uh, ideally, you have a conversation with the um, pathologists who run the uh, department, as well as the infectious disease um, uh, 
um, colleagues uh, to ensure that you have the appropriate testing um, available to you. And how do you guide your doctors in the ER to decide which panel to pick when you have different panels? Um, well, first of all, as you mentioned, the timeliness of the results is important, right? So from an emergency physician's point of view, if they come back too late, it really doesn't impact our care as much as it should. Uh, the key for us is to be able to get timely information that's relevant to our practice. Will that change our practice? So as soon as something affects our practice, we will adopt it. Great. What about you, Dr. Vega? I, um, one of the shocking developments of 2022 is my uh, FQHC, where I work, got a uh, short um, PCR te test uh, available at point of care. So, uh, so yeah, that's, what, that's one of our primary go-tos uh, now. But it can get busy, and so we were told, you know, we can't stress out the machine. It was essentially, we're getting this new, de this new device that will advance our care, don't use it. And so that was, that was the twin <laughs> message. Uh, and so, so I'm a little bit judicious with the ones uh, where patients, where it really will make a difference. And I'm thinking about uh, those who are higher risk, which is the majority of the patients I see. Um, you know, I'm going to use uh, the rapid test. Um, but I still do some send out testing as well. Yeah, excellent point. So I think having point of care testing is key because it really helps you change the practice. If mm -hmm. I have to send a send out and I'm going to get the result in three days, by then the rhinovirus may be already gone. So I think the important things uh, to know from the literature, and these studies from STAM, it was published this year, but in at looking at respiratory influenza um, testing, the clinical decision-making in urgent care centers, what the investigators were able to find is that when the patients were actually tested, they were more likely to prescribe an antiviral and less likely to prescribe an antibiotic. And as the ID doctor in the room, I really want to remind everyone that one of the silent pandemics is antimicrobial resistance. So we really want to make sure we preserve the use of antibiotics when we really need them. If somebody has an uncomplicated respiratory virus infection, not a bacterial infection, high probability of being viral, or your test is showing viral, there is no need to prescribe antibiotics. And we know it takes some time, extra time to counsel the patient, and extra time counseling the parents, and sometimes extra time counseling the doctors. Um, but it's really making sure that we're using antibiotics when we really need them. So the clinicians really need to understand when to use the test, and how is that test going to change your behavior. And this may, like, like Chuck mentioned, help you talk to the the family and understand, well, this is, this is the diagnosis and this is what we're going to do. This is why I'm not giving you any medication and just prescribing symptomatic treatment. So we're going to move into case number two. All right. So imagine um, the emergency department now uh, estimated to have one in two encounters, uh, medical encounters occur in the emergency department. And uh, unfortunately, one in eight uh, of these patients apparently leave the emergency department with an antibiotic uh, prescription. Uh, so there's certainly concern for stewardship of antimicrobial stewardship there. Uh, in this case, a 19-year-old woman presents an emergency department on a busy Saturday night. Um, one day of um, history of malaise, body ache, nasal congestion, sore throat, and subjective fever, but no dyspnea, no GIGU symptoms, has not taken any medication, with no past medical history. So a college student lives in a dorm and does not uh, do drugs, alcohol, tobacco. Up to date in all her vaccines, had three COVID vaccines. Temperature 38.5, heart rate 110, blood pressure 100 over 80, respiratory 12, and O2 saturation 100%. Well appearing, uh, but slightly tired. Um, HENT exam essentially benign, except for mild erythema, but without any exudate. Lungs are clear to auscultation, and no rash in the skin. So question is, what would we like to do next? Should we uh, treat her symptomatically? And advise her regarding isolation precautions and return to the ED instructions and also have a follow-up subsequently in the student health, um, or student health clinic. Or do lab work alone, do lab work in a short panel multiplex PCR, or short panel multiplex PCR test alone, or presumptive treatment with an anti-influenza drug or presumptive treatment with COVID-19. So this is um, tricky, right, in the sense that she does have access, but during the weekend, she has nowhere to go. And this is why patients often come to the ED, because they have access issues. But in this particular case, um, she has an ability to follow up, which is different than most uh, other um, ED um, patients. So you say symptomatic treatment 26, and 32% with lab work and short panel multiplex PCR, and 37% with short panel multiplex PCR test alone. Well, that's interesting. So I agree 
um, in terms of you know the symptomatic uh, treatment, certainly for because we discussed diagnostic stewardship as well as uh, antimicrobial stewardship. Would this um, treatment change if I got the results of a multiplex PCR in this young, healthy patient without past medical history? So that's a consideration. So would, what's your thought, Chuck? I was just thinking, I was just wondering what you thought about lab work. I, I wouldn't necessarily do lab work, but I certainly see a lot of folks who go to emergency who end up getting lab work. Well, good point. And, and, I, would, and I, I assume yeah. we're talking like, what does that even mean? Like, but I right. assume like a CBC, maybe a, pan, a you know, chemistry panel? I'm not sure. No, so I would agree with you. I would certainly not uh, recommend um, doing lab work. But the difference would be to do the um, PCR testing or not. Yeah. And one could argue that you may just treat the patient symptomatically. But she is living in a dorm. Right. And, and the concern is that would she be um, infecting other um, students in the dorm? So that may be one consideration. Now, the what if though? What if this patient actually uh, had a history of insulin dependent diabetes and had intrastitial renal disease and had a kidney pancreas transplant at age 16 and is no longer requiring insulin and has no normal renal function now? What will you do? Would we treat patients symptomatically and tell them to go home and isolate? Will we do blood work? You know, um, she meets SIRS criteria with the um, vital sign that she had and a potential source of infection. Would we now do the entire sepsis workup and, uh, you know, presumptively treat with antibiotics and admit to inpatient? Or will we just do the blood work and then do an extended multiplex respiratory panel? or only the multiplex uh, respiratory panel alone, or presumptive treatment. What's your thought, Dr. Abel? Well, I'm biased because I think <laughs> transplant patients, we always have a low threshold for testing because you know these are the kind of patients that can go from being a little sick to very sick very quickly. So you definitely want to perform some testing, again, with stewardship in mind and making sure that not because you can test, you should test for everything. But I do think lab work and, and at least an extended respiratory panel would be my, my, my suggestion. So, yeah, clearly, most of you do not believe in symptomatic treatment, 50% with a lab work and respiratory panel, and 31% with presumptive treatment with antibiotics and admitted in patient. So again, you know, it's, it's a, a clinical decision, right, at this point. If the patient looks sick, it's unstable, I can understand why you would do presumptive treatment with antibiotics and admitted in patient. But interestingly, let's say that you gave the patient antipyretic, and now the temperature's down, heart rate's down, patient looks more comfortable, um, and it could possibly this patient, you could actually wait for the result of that multiplex uh, test, and that may guide your um, treatment and, and maybe avoid potentially even um, uh, an admission to the hospital, and definitely um, micro, uh, antimicrobial stewardship, you would not uh, start antibiotics in this patient, right? That's so. I was going to say, it's a really nice illustration of that turnaround time and how important it is mm -hmm. because, you know, you can't sit on sepsis, um, you know, patients can get sick very quickly, but that's, that's a really good example. Yeah. Now, next case, again, a 19-year-old without past medical history, but she unfortunately is homeless, uh, uses IV drugs, just started a month ago with a new boyfriend, um, now comes in with um, track marks in the skin, uh, but no evidence of um, gross cellulitis or abscesses. She's tachycardic and it's no gross murmur noted in a busy ED. And with a patient in the hallway, right? So what will you do in this case? Do you do a symptomatic treatment? Do you do blood work, including cultural lactic acid, multiplex testing, HIV and H hepatitis C screening, and presumptive treatment with antibiotics and admit to inpatient? Or just the lab work as above and multiplex PCR testing, or multiplex PCR testing alone, or presumptive treatment? Sadly, we do see a number of these patients, and these patients can be difficult to treat, right? Because they're a a anxious, they're really not interested in uh, being in the emergency department. Uh, they want symptomatic treatment, uh, and then um, once they feel the uh, urge, uh, they may leave the ED before uh, we're able to complete treatment. Um, so often uh, time, it's, this is your only moment, uh, one, one opportunity that you have to really uh, take care of these patients. So again, 3% for the symptomatic treatment, 41% with lab work, uh, with the multiplex PCR testing, and 53% with um, the, the screening as well, presumptive treatment with antibiotics in between patient, and 3% uh, multiplex alone. Um, I, I think that's reasonable. Uh, I know Chuck, you mentioned about uh, lab stewardship. <laughs> right, no, but, not, I think yeah. that's when she was nice and healthy, you know, you know several slides ago. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's been gone for the last two cases. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's reasonable in this case to, um, 
do the lab work, do the HIV and hepatitis C screening, because new HIV uh, presentation can be similar to um, this viral uh, syndrome uh, that we noted in the patient. Uh, also hepatitis C. Uh, I think it's reasonable to um, um, do all those testing. Um, again, it's not wrong to do the testing and not start antibiotics because, again, if the multiplex PCR testing comes back with an answer, um, even though she has risk factors, um, again, you could possibly just treat the patient. And, and where is she going to go, right? How is she going to follow up through on care and, you know, getting a result? So, well, so that's, a, that's a major factor. If you admit well. her, there might be an opportunity to linkage to care through case yep. management. Yeah, so if right. you just let her go, if you just test in the ear, which is something that we yeah. see sometimes, right. then yep. they don't even have a phone number to contact them after. Absolutely. So ideally, we can actually give her the answer while she's there. But if not, uh, oftentimes we can uh, counsel the social worker. We sort of know which shelter they may be or which uh, corner in the street they may be. And uh, we do have uh, access to, to find these patients. Um, lastly, um, same patient now, but it's undocumented resident in the US, um, not vaccinated. Um, lab test came back with point of care urine test is uh, positive, And the patient knows that she likely by date 16 weeks pregnant. Uh, without any prenatal care. Again, do we just treat symptomatically? Um, do we do blood work, blood culture, lactic acid in the whole nine yard? Um, do we do um, lab work and multiplex PCR testing, just multiplex C PCR tests alone, or presumptive treatment? In terms of um, treatment, it really depends on the risk factor and also the um, exposure that they may um, cost other folks, right? So in this case, a pregnant female is at higher risk of mortality and morbidity, right, for um, worsening um, um, risk uh, of worsening um, uh, in the case of uh, treatment, Fetal if you're not treating anti-influenza drugs or not treating with the COVID drugs. So 8% symptomatic, 44% lab work and multiplex PCR, and 38% with the extensive testing and 9% multiplex PCR test alone. That's interesting. Uh, and I, I understand the lab work and the multiplex. I guess because this is an uh, undocumented patient um, and likely have uh, ac difficult access to uh, further care, it may be reasonable to do the blood work and do the uh, multiplex PCR testing uh, and come up with a potential answer. And if she has influence, positive influenza, she, we could treat her with influenza drug or positive COVID, given that she's never been vaccinated and is pregnant. Uh, I would expect to treat. But what do you probably think that's going back to, to the slide, because I think we're, we're moving it. But um, I think that the, the challenge here is you want to make sure that you test, but you're not over testing, like I, everything, right? Just because you have a gallbladder doesn't yeah. mean that you need a cholecystectomy. So, you know, making sure that this patient is linked to her prenatal care, I think, will be important. But right now she's coming, you know, with an uncontrolled pregnancy, early stages. Definitely some minimal testing. I don't think she might need to, to require admission. No. If she's stable, she's saturating okay, um, you know, her labs are normal, you may give her symptomatic treatment. If she has influenza, you may want to give her an antiviral. And if all the panel is negative, this might be an opportunity for her to counsel her about flu vaccine and, and making sure now we have new treatments and, and preventive strategies for other viruses. So I think, you know, this particular talk today is about testing, but I also want to make sure that we emphasize the importance of prevention. And, and vaccination whenever possible. What do mm -hmm. you think about the application of ritonavir boosted nirbatravir uh, uh, in pregnancy? So for HIV? For, for SARS-CoV-2. For SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> It's a, uh, so there is a review, I, I, I want, because it's, it's, um, it's still a controversial, but there was a, a nice uh, study that was published in JAMA that looked at an observational cohort and found no uh, negative effects. Um, but we know that uh, pregnancy is, is a uh, high risk condition uh, for folks with COVID-19. So it's, it's something, it's just, I think right now the advice is shared decision making regarding yes. it, yes. particularly if they have other comorbid, and, and I think certainly if you had uh, you know, uh, gestational diabetes or, or you know, type two, history of type 2 diabetes, maybe there's history of asthma or something on board, then the more risk factors one has for complications of COVID-19, the more I'm going to lean into, yeah, it's worth it to take the uh, treatment. Yeah. So the challenges with the treatment right now are first coverage, uh, since it's no longer free. Right. That's true. And then the second one is, yes, where in pregnancy are you and what's the risk benefit? So mm -hmm. had this patient been previously vaccinated and mm -hmm. had very low risk for yeah. progression to severe disease or like 
having just gestational diabetes, other comorbidities, higher risk for transmission, and we've had some cases of actually intrauterine transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, um, so definitely, again, like everything, risk versus benefit. Yep. And I, I totally agree with you. You have to personalize the care. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a situation of shared decision. In the emergency department, we would often refer this patient uh, to infectious disease as well as OB to assist us with the decision. Yes, absolutely. All right. So we're going to be moving to the next one. So now we're going to shift gears into the broad upper respiratory panel. So we already talked about the short ones. And here's what, you know, there are many, many panels. And again, the performance of the test will vary in their turnaround time, their cost, and the spectrum of what they cover. So I'm not going to read through everything, but, you know, just for education, there are some panels that have 22 targets, other have 15, other have 19. The main differences are what they cover. So most of them cover adenovirus, SARS-CoV-2, but others cover other common coronaviruses, metanumovirus, rhino and entero, influenza, and parainfluenza. And then what these panels also bring is some bacterial, like what we call the atypical bacterial or community-acquired panels, which are usually pertussis, parapertussis, chlamydia, and mycoplasma. There are other panels uh, with other targets, also, again, 22 and 22 targets, and the turnaround time for everything, as you saw before, about 45 minutes to less than two hours. Compared to the short panels that are more point of care, these are tests that usually are not available as a point of care. They're usually done in the laboratory. They require validation, and, and you know, it's a little more cumbersome, um, but they're usually available in very large health systems. And then there are other brands uh, which have, again, different turnaround times, less than three hours, around two hours, and similar, 20 to 16 targets. So we just wanted to make sure we're not promoting any particular panel, just different manufacturers offer different brands and they have different uh, targets. So what's really the, the impact of these multiplex panels in, and testing in the emergency department? Well, in patients that are greater um, than a year old, the symptoms of, of upper respiratory infection with a flu-like illness and not on antibiotics, comparing the usual care versus these multiplex panels had a trend towards decreased use of antibiotics. Um, it really didn't change the use of antivirals, and as you can imagine, we don't have antivirals for every virus, um, but, and it also didn't change the length of stay or the disposition, but it's really more on do you prescribe an antibiotic or not. For adult patients, a switching to a multiplex panel uh, with a clinically actionable turnaround time actually decreased hospital admissions in admitted adults uh, without focal uh, changes radiographically and also decreased antibiotic utilization. The important point here is that we do nothing with a test, even if it's the fastest test, if you don't act on the information. So if you're going to order a test, your pretest probability, you need to have a pretest probability for ordering, and then you need to know that you're going to act on those results. Uh, I hate when people send us just for sending them and, you know, oh, it's not going to change your management, but then don't bother ordering it. But in these cases, um, what we really want to make sure is that, you know, there are two sides of every coin, right? In this study, they actually looked at um, comparing prescribed antibiotics as a primary outcome when the, the clinician knew the PCR results versus when the clinician didn't know uh, the PCR results. So randomizing 900 kids uh, with an acute respiratory illness, you can see, you know, that there is some, some significant uh, differences and uh, risk, uh, relative risk reductions when you knew the results. Now, when you indiscriminately, let's say we just order a respiratory panel every child in the ER, that's not going to change practice. So, so we really need to make sure that if you know the result that you act on it, just ordering testing does not change practice if you don't act on the results. All right, we're going All right, back I'm to I'm covering chapter. case three. All right, um, so we have a 45-year-old patient now in chemotherapy for acute myelogenous leukemia. PCP appointment today is scheduled for knee pain. He's not seeing oncology today. He's just coming in for knee pain. That was, his, that was scheduled, but whoa, he has a fever on presentation. Cough for a day. And so he is admitted directly to the hospital uh, because of the fever and uh, the fact that he is immunosuppressed. 
Um, and he started in cefepine and vancomycin and the waiting culture results, but then he develops respiratory distress, hypertension, hypoxemia, uh, he has to be intubated, put on mechanical ven ventilation, transfer to MICU, um, and he's diagnosed with septic shock. Day two, still febrile, neutropenic, he's on uh, high flow, he's, he's weaned down to high flow nasal cannula, and his blood culture negative on that day. And so this, again, speaks to uh, you know, using uh, the right decision making. And so for this patient, um, you know, he should come in. He's going to need that broad coverage. He's going to need immediate uh, coverage with antibiotics. So that was all done appropriately. And, and that right now, though, we don't really, we still don't know we're treating. He's, he still has a fever. He's neutropenic. Um, and so therefore, we need to you know, think about how we can actually use these tests. And these are some of the goals and some of the, and some of I think the findings uh, from research-based studies looking at um, these multiplex uh, PCR tests used in different systems. So we're talking about increasing stewardship, stewardship of testing, and definitely stewardship of uh, antivirals and antibiotics. The higher risk your patient is, the more benefit you're likely to get out of it. So you know what you're treating, and you can, and as we know, for you know, maybe with our earlier case with a 19-year-old who's otherwise healthy, a six-year-old who's otherwise healthy, you know, they're they're, they're definitely not going to qualify for treatment for uh, for COVID-19, uh, and and even with influenza, you know, it might be an elective opportunity if they really wanted to take an anti-influenza drug, but it's not mandated because they're not at high risk for complications. So really, focus these tests on your highest risk patients. When you're an inpatient, I think just don't forget about uh, the fact that you know this patient had a fever, yes, and they're neutropenic, yes, but they also had a cough. And so I'm sure they got a chest x-ray. I, I, I'm sure that was part of the workup. But was there anything else done? And then um, if by the time they get to ICU, you know, maybe they're going to catch this. They might need to actually get a, a lower respiratory specimen. So let's go back to case three, and lo and behold, so they did do uh, a multiplex panel, and they showed that the, uh, the viral panel was positive for RSV. So not necessarily what we expected. And so when we look at the efficacy of um, the, the using multiplex respiratory panels, there is a substantial reduction in the use of antibiotics and a stronger in improvement in the use of antiviral agents. I remember one study that looked at a large health system, and it was a retrospective review of, of records uh, among patients presenting with influenza-like illness. So the, among individuals who presented who were at high risk for complications of influenza, presented to the health system within 48 hours, kind of your magic two-day mark for influenza symptoms, and actually eventually had a positive test uh, for influenza, how many of them received uh, antiviral drugs? Anybody want to guess? Nine? Or, yeah, well, that's, that's really pessimistic. 37%. So that's, that is like right down the middle for like who needs an anti-influenza drug is, and 28% and received antibiotics, which were probably inappropriate. So it's, it's moving your framework. So when that high risk patient in a high acuity situation where they come in within a couple days, that is, that's where these tests are really gonna be beneficial. And you want a good turnaround time because absolutely the faster, I think with a good rule of thumb for all these viral illnesses, the sooner you treat them, the better your results are gonna be generally speaking. And, and it also impacts infection control measures. So it's a, it's a way that um, I'm trying to be a good steward for my uh, antimicrobials. I'm trying to be a good steward uh, for testing. I also want to be a good steward for my community. And, and so I I'm very much believe in, you know, in isolating at home, for, for particularly you know, if you're going back to a dorm or, gosh, if you, so many um, families in my community, they live three, sometimes even four generations in the same house, crowded conditions. There's no room where they can just go you know, and separate for five days. Um, they're going to be mixing up right there with their 90-year-old great-grandmother. And so uh, that's, that's a real concern. And so I think that's another uh, reason we can think about it, either in an institutionalized setting or um, even in the home setting. And so uh, this is uh, looking at, this was a study that actually looked at uh, cost effectiveness as well as the clinical impact. And overall, it was found that particularly when the turnaround time is reasonable, under 1.5 hours, and I think patients now are very much more accustomed to, please go out and wait in your car for the next 30 minutes. Um, and that's, that's a problem in our institution because we don't always have uh, a, a they, people use the bus. And so, uh, so, some, so luckily we live in California, so they can go way outside for 30 minutes and we'll, we'll get you your results in. 
Um, so when the turnaround time is reasonable, you can see improvements in hospital, hospitalization length of stay, certainly antibiotic use, and less studies too. And how many of you love following up incident lomas that were found with over-testing, right? So the uric acid is slightly high. No, oh, this could be a granuloma in the, in the lung fields, but it could be a cancer too. So better get a CT. And instead, and, and I find in my practice that, you know, instead of talking about, hey, you know, there's this new monovalent booster out, or, you know, let's get, let's, have we talked about colorectal cancer screening lately, or the lifestyle, other stuff that I really want to talk to my patients about and spend some time with. Instead, it's like, well, we have to get approval for a CT scan of your chest now, and I'm going to recheck a uric acid. And what's uric acid? Well, it's, it's, it's complicated. So, um, there, and there are some caveats. Uh, randomized control trials uh, don't do uh, quite as well with multiplex panels. I think that's because we're all clinicians and we're, you know, there's factors there that, you know, maybe even the algorithm doesn't account for. And less, less evidence in pediatric and inpatient settings because we get, tend to get, I think, a little bit more fixed in our ways. And, uh, and this is great because uh, now Lillian's going to take us through like a, a system, systematic approach and a more of a framework for how we can actually apply uh, some of what we just learned about some of the benefits of multiplex testing. Thank you. And, and many of you are already posting questions. Some of them are streaming, so keep bringing in. We're going to have some time for Q&A at the end, but some of you have been asking about procalcitonin and CRP. So in the next cases, we're going to be talking about how to add those two yeah. tests, because like everything, um, how do you interpret the test and how do you apply it? That's, I think it's the magic. Anyone can order a test. Knowing when to order it and how to order it and how to interpret it is, is the more challenging part. So I think there are three domains, and this is a great study by Tim Brook. Just, just one uh, point of caution, this is a, a study that uh, was sponsored, um, one of the main authors, Tim Brook, actually works for one of the laboratory diagnostic companies. But the, the, the paper itself is not promoting any particular diagnostic test, but mostly thinking uh, in terms of operational domains and how this may affect your clinical outcomes and the management of your patients. So when we think of when to choose a test, I think, you know, as family physicians, sometimes, you know, it may be beyond your control, but I think the key questions that I would ask is, what's the sensitivity, the specificity of the test? How reliable is it? Like every time I test you, I'm gonna get reliable results or the test is performing like with, you know, a very low sensitivity, like a, you know, like a flu antigen, like we mentioned. The diagnostic yield and the turnaround time. And this is important because if you are in your office, your turnaround time Time may be different than if you are sending somebody to the urgent care or if somebody's in the emergency department or if somebody's hospitalized. And the same thing for a nursing home patient. So the turnaround time, I think it's key. Now, do I really want to know the results at three in the morning in somebody that's hospitalized? Am I going to wake up at three in the morning and call in, you know, a different prescription or can that wait until 7 a.m.? That's also important. So you, when, when we talk about turnaround time, you also need to know if you are in an inpatient or outpatient setting, what times do you really want to perform those tests and at what time are you going to act on those results? Then you also need to take into account some, you know, contextual factors, you know, the diagnostic stewardship, how are you implementing your diagnostic algorithms? We use uh, our electronic computer system like Cerner, so sort of to prompt people in our uh, power plans, what we call is, you know, we have diagnostic power plans where you're coming in with community acquired pneumonia and we want to prompt you to certain tests versus others. So there are ways to building clinical decision support tools in the hospitalized setting. In the outpatient setting, it depends if you're a solo practitioner or in a multi-specialty group, this might be important for you to discuss with your groups, okay, how are we gonna practice in our family medicine clinic, right? How, what, what kind of approach do we wanna follow? And maybe you wanna build your own clinical algorithms to decide, hey, in these patients, we may wanna test, or in others, we may not wanna test. And then again, like everything, precision medicine, you need to look at the individual. So there are, again, human factors that are going to affect your clinical decisions. Then the other two or three domains are patient domains, the economic domain, and the societal domain. So from a patient domain, you really want to look at, is this going to change morbidity and mortality, right? Am I going to change the length of stay if I prescribe a test sorry. or not? Oh, sorry. It wasn't up there. So yeah, I, that flips I'm it to, to, that flips to, the, it to the sweater. Okay. But that way they can see it. Is that okay? Can you see it now? Yeah, can you see it now? I see it. Okay, okay yeah, I'm perfect. Gonna start, no, yeah, I'm going to start yeah, seeing yeah, that screen because we have two screens here, and I think we are seeing things that you're not seeing, so I apologize. So, um, 
What you want to look here on, on the green is the patient domain, and then in the blue is the economic domain. So from an economic perspective, you want to look at what's the cost of these tests, right? Is this really worth, um, you know, there, is it going to get reimbursed? Do we need ancillary tests? Do I need to order a CRP and a Procal and a urine antigen and other, you know, additional imaging? And from an infection control, how is this test going to affect our infection and isolation measures, our different type of protective personnel equipment, different bed placement? So all of these, when you're implementing testing, it has to be built into the process flow and the mapping. Multiple people are going to be affected by these results. So I do nothing by adding a test if I have no way of notifying in real time the nurses at bedside, our infection control team, that this patient needs a certain type of isolation. You know, otherwise you're gonna have a patient with SARS-CoV-2 in a room, and some of our rooms are still shared. We don't have all private rooms. Some of our ICUs are open bays. So I don't wanna have someone with a highly contagious respiratory infection that potentially is spreading to everybody else. That's why having timely results, perhaps in my ER, helps me also with bed placement, knowing where we're gonna put the patient to protect the healthcare workers and the other patients that are gonna be there. Um, and again, from a patient domain, you want to make sure that you, if you're going to be using this test, it's going to help you streamline when to use therapy, when not to use therapy, and which type of therapy. And then for a society domain, like we mentioned, we don't want to put more pressure and create more problems with antimicrobial resistance. It's very easy to prescribe broad spectrum antibiotics. I always say the same. You know, anyone can prescribe antibiotics, but knowing when to prescribe them and the appropriate duration, it, it's really key. So again, like we have been mentioning, one size does not fit all. And, and this is where I emphasize precision medicine. Getting tests in five minutes has no value if you're not gonna act on those results. And knowing when to order the test and ordering the right test, it's important. So that's what we sort of wanna convey with, this, with these cases. So I'm gonna move gears into, into really diagnostic stewardship, and it's really something that we have been talking about, right? It's how do you translate you know, this result into, into making a change at bedside? And there are different goals of stewardship. We have antimicrobial stewardship and diagnostic stewardship. Diagnostic stewardship is very simple. You wanna get the right test for the right patient at the right time. And it has to conserve healthcare resources. If you're just ordering tests just for the sake of ordering, it's not improving clinical care. And then for antimicrobial stewardship is really interpreting that test appropriately and then prescribing the right therapy for the right time and the right duration. So the goal ultimately is only to prescribe antibiotics in people who really need it, and the same for antivirals. Some of these antivirals also have side effects and adverse reactions, so you really wanna make sure that you prescribe on the people who really will need it. And at the end of the day, it's value-based care. You wanna make sure that we deliver at the lowest cost possible the best outcomes. So when you're gonna pick a test, how do I pick if I need to order a procalcitonin or a short panel or a long panel or the additional test that we were saying and the same thing that you would say, do I need an x-ray or not? One, what is my clinical setting and is this test appropriate in this clinical setting? Two, how will this patient be affected by the results? Three, are the results gonna be available in a timely manner? If I need to send it out to Quest and I'm gonna get the result in three days or any other send out lab, is it really gonna change my practice today? And then four is, will the clinician understand the result? And many times I ask this because some of these diagnostic tests and molecular testings are not so easy to interpret. And you really need to make sure that people are understanding the results the way they are intended to be um, you know, expressed. So very important things, with the onset of all these new diagnostic and multiplex testing and point of care testing, we have seen a significant reduction from the traditional methods. It was taking us days, sometimes five to seven days to get culture results, whether it's a PCR for blood or a respiratory panel, and now we're getting these results on the same day and sometimes on the same time. So I think what these tests have shifted, and we saw it with the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was mission impossible, at least in Florida, if we wanted to know if somebody had had SARS-CoV-2. We had to fill, I don't know how many pages of paperwork. We had to call the Department of Health. Then we would have to get approval. It would be sent to the health department and then to the CDC. And some of the results were coming back within a week or two. Wow. And this yeah. is in the early stages of the pandemic. Uh, half of my team still has PTSD. 
Then we saw the same thing with monkey ball, uh, with mpox. Uh, when, when patients started presenting with skin lesions and we were suspecting mpox, Dr. Lee was calling me like, my doctors have no time to be filling 30 pages, right? And calling the health department to get approval for, for testing. So I think having available tests, especially when you have an epidemic going on, rapid spread of a disease, it's key. And this is a public health issue. It affects your individual practice, but it affects the public transmission and the prevention of contagion. So these tests, when well used, they do change lives and in, a, in a very fast way. And um, we're gonna go with a little more uh, patient cases to keep you awake. So let's go with case <laughs> number four. I just want to say that you know you may be thinking, gosh, it takes it it only takes two to three hours to run one of these extended multiplex panels. You know, why don't I get results back same day? It seems like you should. It's because the laboratories will generally batch the those samples together for efficiency and cost savings. And so uh, right now we've had we have a, essentially a one day turnaround in Orange County, but it can be two days uh, still. So you, the, absolutely, when you have to, it's about are you going to be there? How are you going to respond? Um, you know, is somebody covering for you? I don't want to leave a dangling result. And then the person covering me says, what is this? I, I didn't know about, uh, about this. So I think there's a lot of factors to consider. Not just patient factors come first, but you also have to think about system factors and, um, and even your personal factors about like, what you can do and where, where you'll be. So think about that as we go through some of these cases. Um, so I've got a 48-year-old man, multiple chronic illnesses, complains of eight-day history of wet cough, sore throat, nasal congestion, primary care appointment. So eight days. Um, no sinus pressure, fever yesterday, actually. That's interesting. Uh, fatigue, but not, 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 not dyspneic. Patient's partner and a child were diagnosed with COVID-19 about 10 days ago with a home antigen test. One thing with the home antigen test, uh, the, and, and the sensitivity with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2 is better than it is for influenza, generally speaking. Um, but when you get a pot, if you have somebody who's sick and you've got the flu circulating in your community and you have a positive test, even a cheap test like an antigen test, the specificity is very high, above 95%. So you can pretty much say, yeah, that the, I, I would not doubt if, if COVID circulating, that um, uh, that this is that those are true cases, and the fact they both had uh, positive tests kind of makes sense to me. But look at his past history with diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney, uh, hyperlipid, depression, and elevated BMI. Lots of risk factors there. So if he has COVID, he you know even though he's 48 years old, uh, we still I'm still considering him at significantly elevated risk because it's the mix of risk factors. He's also on some medications, and so if I'm thinking, gosh, he very likely, it's, I'm leaning towards COVID right now. I don't, certainly don't know COVID, but I'm leaning towards it right now. Um, so I'm going to take a close look at his medication list. Why? Because I'm probably going to go with, the, you know, it's rare when NIH actually makes a recommendation for one um, antiviral drug or antibacterial drug over another, and they're very clear. They prefer ritonavir boosted nematravir, well tolerated, effective, particularly if he's not been vaccinated. I see he has been. That's another factor, but uh, the main side of, or the main drawback with uh, with the ritonavir boosted nematravir is drug interactions. So how many of you use the Liverpool checker or one another tool? So yeah, and there's a couple there that would boom, 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 uh, light up three that I can count. So um, luckily nothing severe, uh, and we can get into yeah how. To, but but this is the calculus that I'm thinking of as as I'm going through uh, this case. Um, it's a 15 pack year smoker, but he quit five years ago. And very importantly, we're seeing this, this shift now, whereas before age was such an important risk factor for the most severe outcomes, ICU admission, mortality associated with COVID-19. Now it's vaccination status. And we're seeing a lot of 48 year olds, unfortunately, who are in the, in the, and the factor that pushes them into the ICU is that they weren't vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we got a good other, uh, good other vaccination history as well. And hey, he's one of the few uh, folks uh, 19 to, uh, to, to uh, 64 who's actually received his pneumococcal vaccination. Good on him. So um, I'm, I am concerned <clears throat> that he had a fever yesterday. I don't know if anybody noticed that, but eight days and he had fever on day seven. That's curious. Blood pressure's high. He's not, not febrile now. He's satting okay. He's got some rhinorrhea, some lymphadenopathy, some, egg, uh, some posterior erythema without exate. His lungs are clear and his heart's regular. And you, can have, you have access to both point of care and send out multiplex regimens. 
So here's your choices. Short panel multiplex, extended multiplex, treat for symptoms, initiate antivirals against influenza and COVID-19, initiate antibiotics now, order chest x-ray and antibiotics if an infiltrate is found. How about delayed prescription for antibiotics? We haven't brought up that one yet, uh, where you say, hey, you know what? If you're, I'm gonna send in a prescription for I don't know, doxy, macrolide, whatever, you say, um, amoxicillin with cl uh, clavulanate, and start if symptoms not better in three days. Please mark your answers. These are, this is a little nuance to me, because, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a few things that stand out that are a little bit different here. But it's a very typical patient I see in my practice. Certainly, so I'm, I'm interested to see what y'all think. I, and I don't think there's a, you know, a right answer. So mm -hmm. short panel multiplex PCR test, um, chest X-ray and antibiotics if infiltrate, order an extended multiplex respiratory panel are the popular choices and uh, not, not using the antibiotics. Uh, you've been trained well. Look at that stewardship. <laughs> All right, so, um, so. I'm proud of you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I, I agree, I, I, when I see this case, um, I, I, why are you having a fever on day seven of illness? I'm worried about a secondary infection. I assume he, he probably has COVID-19 because he's got those household contacts. Could he have RSV or flu as well? Yes, it's, so it's very reasonable to order an extended multiplex respiratory panel, but he's outside that window. Um, of treatment, you know, for influenza, for, um, you know, so for influenza, you can certainly break the glass on that 48 hour window for, for treatment um, with an anti-influenza drug because he is high risk. So you can treat him at day three, day four, but if you're still sick on day five with influenza, which usually comes on pretty strong, but also tends, yes, you may have some congestion and cough, but you should be having fever, severe myalgias, that's odd. I'm worried about a secondary infection in him. So I think a, a chest X-ray uh, seems like an appropriate uh, study, and maybe he picked up something else. We are seeing um, you know, rates of RSV just over this past two weeks has, have started to increase. Um, so maybe it could be something else there too. I don't know if you have any other input. Yeah, Sound little in your I, I think I, I would like to hear, well, your, the patient is presented to your office, right? If the patient presented to the ER and was desaturating, probably is a little right. different, but I agree with you. Someone with eight days of, of, of multiple comorbidities, right? Multiple <coughs> medications and still day seven, have, having a fever, having rhinorrhea and a cough, I agree that it's completely appropriate to do a multiplex PCR because maybe there is an overimposed bacterial yeah. infection or an atypical mm -hmm. organism non-viral. And, and again, depending on auscultation, if there is anything concerning, I may get a chest X-ray, and if there is an infiltrate, you may want to prescribe antibiotics to cover it atypical. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. I think the, the physical exam and a, probably a multiplex panel would be appropriate in this particular setting, considering the exposure to COVID and the comorbidities. So Dr. Gabo, what would you consider um, a strategy for the emergency department? Because the extended multiplex panel would likely not come back within Correct. the time, right? So is it reasonable in that case to treat empirically with an antibiotics for bacterial superinfection? I think you are going to auscultate the patient, right? And you're gonna get, you know, their saturation. You're probably gonna get some basic labs and a chest X-ray. So if the patient has infiltrates and definitely has either crackles or wheezing, sure. I would probably prescribe uh, a short course of antimicrobial therapy. And that's another thing. Uh, we have demonstrated that sometimes less is more. So we don't need to prescribe antibiotics for 10 or 15 days for a respiratory infection. There are studies that in uncomplicated myocardial pneumonia, three days could be as effective, three to five days, depending on the antibiotics. So in, a, in an emergency department setting with someone with all these comorbidities, clinical and radiological findings, I, I might empirically treat. Yeah, and so I, 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 that was on perp, the eight days was purposeful, the fever on day seven was purposeful, and the clear lungs were all purposeful, because that would make it a lot easier. Instead, it's, it is, there's, there's definitely a gray area here. One thing that is tricky, because it absolutely does hinge a lot on physical exam, what if this was a telehealth appointment? See, the, I, you know, th we used to have 30% uh, of our appointments are still telehealth. Great, convenient, mm -hmm. wonderful f following up. So maybe I already made a diagnosis in this person and we've got, uh, we have the, uh, the multiplex back and we're, we have initiated therapy, whatever it may be. And following up, that's great to use to do the phone. But yeah, it's like, this is sometimes where I'm just, I'm sure you've been there too, um, with, on Zoom or over the phone and just kind of kicking yourself like, man, I really need to see, I would love to see you and be able to examine uh, because I, it's really hard to tell right now. And, and that, that, might, that in of itself, if you're thinking telehealth for that patient, that would be a good reason to get chest x-ray right there. Right. I agree, and hopefully in the near future, we will be able to have uh, better diagnostics at home. So yeah. when we do telehealth, we're gonna be able to actually examine our patients. 
Okay, case number five. All right. So another patient coming to the emergency department, 65-year-old women presented with three-day history of malaise, body ache, and dry cough. Subjective fever at home and chills. Denies any sore throat or GIGU symptoms. Denies any chest pain or dyspnea without any sick contact. Per medical history, hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic sinusitis, migraine. Surgical history, tonsillectomy, adenectomy. Uh, social history, tobacco use, one pack per day, per week, for years. Temperature 36.8, heart rate 79, blood pressure 122 over 78, um, O2 saturation 98% on room air. Uh, exam, essential and remarkable. And what I want to point out also is that when you ask her about, um, sorry, trying to go back, her uh, medical history, is she taking any medication? Yeah. Well, she said that she hasn't seen a doctor in um, a few months. Um, she occasionally takes um, blood pressure medication that she borrows from her friends. Uh, and um, she has not been vaccinated for any uh, COVID or influenza. And uh, additionally, um, she um, was, um, oh, I'm blocking this. She has difficult access to, um, oh, that's right. So this patient actually has um, recent visits to the ED about six months ago with normal lab work. And reviewing her records while in the emergency department, she basically uses the emergency department as a primary care clinic. So the question now is, what do we do? Symptomatic ED treatment or outpatient management, lab work with short panel multiplex PCR, short panel multiplex PCR test alone, presumptive treatment with an anti-influenza drug, and presumptive treatment of COVID or chest X-ray and antibiotics infiltrate. And the concern here is the access to care, right? Where, where, whether this person is gonna be able to afford the medication uh, and also whether she'll be able to um, follow up subsequently. What, um, is she on anything for her RA? No, okay. so I, again, basically it's a patient that have all these multiple medical problems but it's really not followed by anyone yeah. with the history of all those medical conditions. Because yeah, so RA would be a, you know a minor risk factor for complications, but RA with a biologic on board moves it up. Yeah. So we often have patient that comes in right and say that they have certain illness, but it's not clear they're properly um, defined. Right. So in this case, um, okay, we're saying 16% symptomatic ED treatment, 26% um, short panel multiplex PCR alone, lab work with short, um, short panel multiplex PCR 45% and presumptive treatment of anti-influenza drug and order in chest that antibiotics infiltrate. Well, so um, the discussion about uh, diagnostic stewardship is whether we're gonna act on the uh, result of the testing. So in this case, the patient has risk factors, right? She's 65 years old, she does have a history of hypertension, a poorly managed, um, difficult access um, to care. There are social determinant factors that may affect her, um, uh, increase her risk um, for deterioration if she was um, affected with influenza or with um, COVID. Um, so this might indicate that you could consider testing with a multiplex PCR test. And the question is whether you do lab work or not, because as we mentioned before, should she be positive and we treat her with anti-COVID medication, we perhaps would need to evaluate the renal function of this patient. Uh, in this case, the patient had lab work within six months. So what do you think, Dr. Babo? Well, she had normal lab work in the last six months, so I think I may not see a, a she's stable. She's not hemodynamically unstable. I don't right. see the need to do extensive laboratory work right now. Right, so it turns out this patient did get a multiplex, um, a short multiplex panel. It was positive for COVID. Okay. This is an actual patient in the ED, and she was um, prescribed uh, her antiviral, um, anti-COVID medication. Uh, she was sent home with instruction to um, return should she uh, worsen, and we attempted to uh, connect her with a primary care um, clinic in the system. The next one is a 58-year-old man with two-day history of sore throat, uh, left ear pain, body aches, and subjective fever, no cough, no chest pain, no dyspnea, no GIG <coughs> symptoms, no sick contact, no past medical history, no surgical history, lives with a uh, wife at home, uh, and denies any uh, drug, alcohol, or tobacco use. Again, well appearing, um, temperature 36.9, mildly um, tachycardic, blood pressure 151 over 84, O2 size 98%. Um, the HENT exam shows tonsillar swelling, erythema with exudate, 
TM within normal limits, no mastoid tenderness, neck supple, no lymphadenopathy, uh, lungs clear to auscultation bilaterally, and heart sounds tachycardic but no murmurs, uh, skin no rash, and patient did have subjective fever at home. Um, so the question is, now she's 58 years old, so in terms of age, not significant risk factor, um, no past medical history, um, have reasonable access to care, um, what will we do in this case? Symptomatic treatment, um, or order a short panel multiplex PCR, order an extended multiplex respiratory panel, order a short panel multiplex PCR and a strep A PCR, uh, presumptive treatment for anti-influenza drug, presumptive treatment for COVID-19, or presumptive treatment for strep pharyngitis. In this case, the patient actually, I mentioned, did not, was not vaccinated for uh, COVID, and when you ask him why, he says, I don't believe in it. Yep. So what do you think? Definitely been there. <laughs> But don't give up. I've had patients uh, decide, hey, there's this new monovalent one. I want that one. I, I don't really ask too much. It's at that point, it's like, let's get this vaccine on board now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, unfortunately, not being vaccinated is a significant risk factor for progression of disease with um, COVID. Um, and um, in this case, I think it's important to rule it out. Um, um, uh, so 2% ordered an extended multiplex respiratory panel. It's interesting. And 14% order short panel, and then 60% order short panel, as well as a strep A PCR, and 1% presumptive treatment for COVID-19. Um, so remember now, I, I don't think we could do presumptive treatment of COVID-19. It's required that you actually right. have a test, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Now, very good. Tricky. Um, and if this patient actually turned out to have a positive strep and negative uh, short and yeah. clinically um, had, panel. And clinically had X-rays and had yep. ear pain. Right. So the physical no cough. exam right. was... So important to highlight that the, the multiplex PCR, the extended panel, will not include strep A. Exactly. And, and I think that's something that um, it's important. So the short panel would have perfectly ruled out SARS-CoV-2 if that was a concern. And, and definitely you want to get a rapid strep test because mm -hmm. the culture may take several days. So yeah, that's what I was wondering because you know here the the majority and it was I think that would be my answer too the short panel multiplex PCR and strep A would you just would is the multiplex panel necessary here or would you think this uh, this sounds enough like strep I a done, fifty eight year old man. I probably would have done a strep A and if it's negative yeah. then I would have done the right yeah the, the antigen test the antigen, yeah then, but yeah. knowing the flow in the ER they, yes. they want to send everything plus five <laughs> tubes of blood just in case yeah. and two blood cultures. In case they need it. So with the time, with the time constraint, remember, we, we can't do sequential testing sometimes in the ED. And thank goodness Dr. Abu understands. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, uh, we do parallel processing. Uh, and in this case, a patient was um, identified with a proper diagnosis and sent home with amoxicillin uh, and with a good explanation as to why he has what he has. I thought the ear pain was a nice touch because uh, pharyngitis can radiate to the ear, so mm -hmm. I thought that was that was clever. Or it could have been a mycoplasma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. <laughs> that too. There you go. All right, moving on to case seven. Who's still awake? Raise your hand. Who wants right. more wine? Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah. That. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I, I don't know if they still yeah, right. close the bar. I hope the ones streaming are also watching us. If you're having coffee at home and drinking wine, yeah, and drinking wine. Yeah. Okay. Patient case number seven. All right, so now we have a 22-year-old lady. She has a three-day history of a dry cough and is wheezing, and this one is a telehealth appointment. So she was diagnosed with asthma when she was nine years old, and she's on um, budesonide for motoral daily for control. She has required four extra doses for rescue in the last two days, and she has Disney walking up to two flights of stairs to her apartment and some mild nasal congestion and some tactile fever. She works as a restaurant and many people who are working with her there also have an upper respiratory infection. And in addition to this, she's vaping, uh, but since yesterday she got back and she's not using any other drugs. Um, she has none of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines and her last influenza vaccine was about eight years ago when she went to the pediatrician. So, um, I, don't, I think we don't have a question, yeah, no question, an audience response on this one, but, but we, I think we can chat amongst ourselves. Yeah. And um, Chuck, what do you think? What do you think is going on with her and what would be your next step? 
Um, I, I would definitely, uh, you know, given the asthma, which sounds at least uh, moderate um, in nature, I would uh, certainly want to get um, a, uh, hopefully it's telehealth. Um, so I, I would try to get her into clinic so I could get a, um, you know, do the, uh, the short rapid panel and, uh, and you know, just, just have it set up so that she can come and get tested and then we can call her with a result. Um, that would probably be the most efficient way to treat her. Uh, she's 22, so she could be considered for either an anti-COVID or an anti-influenza drug if she's positive. Um, so I, I think that it'd be worth it. That's, that's what I, I would probably do. I don't think I would do the extended multi, uh, multiplex testing just based on this alone because it wouldn't, it, unfortunately, she's already on day three. You really are kind of at the limits of, of effective antiviral treatment right now. So being devil's advocate, uh, now she says, well, what about if I can go to the pharmacy, you know, next door and get a rapid antigen? Would that be enough? Or do I really need to go and get tested in the lab? I would, I would say if, if you have it available, particularly if you're, well, I don't really want her going out and about uh, right now. But, um, but if she can get, so many times patients have one, like, oh, yeah, it's in the, yeah, they haven't thought about it in a while. Uh, but since the pandemic went mostly DIY, you know, a lot of people have stored antigen testing. And so it's, I've actually waited and I have waited on, the, on telehealth like, and done other work while the patient goes and swabs himself. And yes, this is, this is the future maybe. And so, they, and so we waited like uh, five minutes and, and then you know, lo and behold, it was positive. So I was, I was like, what are we, so it's, I have to wait 15 minutes. And, but I just had her on kind of on hold and I went and saw other patients. Well, so, and, and there is some yeah. announcement that actually this week, the, there's one of the companies that it's presenting to the FDA, one of the first self-administered in, uh, intranasal uh, influenza vaccines. So if this gets approved for 2024, 2025, in the near future, patients might be able to give themselves their own vaccines at home wow. as well. Amazing. So, you know, shifting the, the care at home, this might be some of the things that we're going to be seeing in the future, right? Um, Dr. Lee, what do you think? Um, well, I, we currently do not do telehealth at our emergency department, but I know that some other emergency departments do do telehealth. Um, but uh, again, uh, Unfortunately, uh, given her risk factors, it's definitely it's a concern. She's not vaccinated uh, against COVID-19, uh, and she's not vaccinated against influenza. Um, we would need some testing there from our point of view because it's not someone that we follow in our clinic. We wouldn't have a clinic. You know, there's like someone that's seeking um, episodic care in the ED. We have no other medical uh, records on this patient. I would recommend that she comes into the ED and we do the um, testing. Uh, and, and if necessary, uh, three day out, we still treat if she has, uh, if she's COVID positive. Uh, and one could even argue, I guess, um, given she's high risk, if she's positive for influenza, we may also offer influenza treatment. And, and the other thing about seeing her is, is we have to consider her pulmonary function right now and the exacerbation of her asthma. And so getting a, you know, a stethoscope on her chest and really thinking about, does, you know, it's always that decision point. Uh, you know, corticosteroids, or, and we're talking systemic oral corticosteroids in this case, or, um, or no, um, yeah, it's, that's, that's a tough one, to, you know, and so if nothing else, she's going to get close follow-up because I don't like the fact that her dyspnea is, is this You read my mind because that was yeah. my next question. So I, was, I, was prob I would probably, <laughs> just based on this, I might lean towards giving it, but remember when you give prednisone, you are going to, you know, her immune response will not be as strong and so therefore, um, you know, there's the risk of uh, infection. And, Prednisone, even short courses, is associated with you know uh, negative outcomes uh, for even among young people. So therefore, I really try to avoid it uh, when I can. Yep, mm -hmm. and maybe you want to counsel her that she should not be vaping. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So some key takeaways before we go into the Q and A is that. You know, the appropriate use of, of all of these panels has a positive impact if you use them appropriately. One, antimicrobial stewardship, it can really guide you when to use an antibiotic, when to use antiviral, or when not to use any of them. Um, improving the accuracy, you know, we can counsel people on when to isolate and how to isolate or when you can go back to work, especially for us doctors, it's very hard to isolate and, you know, tell a surgeon you can't go back to the OR. And also, in epidemics and pandemics, is really helping uh, tracing, contact tracing, and having a very fast response in terms of public health. So we want to make sure that we come out of this talk tonight understanding that there is value in using these tests, but if there is more value in using them appropriately, getting results in a timely manner, and acting on those results in an informed way. And making sure that whatever we do is really to optimize patient care, using the right test, 
for the right patient at the right time, interpreting the right way, and treating appropriately when necessary. So we have a few more minutes and we're gonna go into our Q&A. Uh, please use your QR codes on your tables. We have several questions, I'm, I'm gonna be going over them. And um, let's start with the first one. So in our facility, we are having issues with Medicare and Medicaid covering an extended multiplex panel. They will only pay for a five target panel. What are your suggestions on coding and overturning denials? Wow, I mean, it's not a time you can fight about those things, right? This is something, you, how many, I was just curious, because uh, Lillian brought up a really good point that, you know, oftentimes we have no control. I have no control um, over, you know, the kinds of testing we offer within our system. How many of you actually have some say in, say, a point of care test that you buy? So, one, you're, you're, so you're our expert, actually. But, uh, but, but yeah, so I, I would say that you might just get stuck, I w you know, you, I would not try to argue with the insurance coverage at this time, but I would certainly try to talk to your practice manager or your, your leadership and try to get that changed because it could be beneficial and you are going to catch cases of, of uh, chlamydia, say, or even strep pneumo. Remember that in the early days of SARS-CoV-2, um, co-infection rates were really high in reports coming out of China, something along between 20 and 25 percent and mycoplasma was common, parainfluenza was common, in addition to SARS-CoV-2. So, um, so yeah, I think that there, there could be reasons for it, but it's not the time or place. Get your five, um, five pathogen panel and, and move forward with that case. I think for us, what, what I can talk a little bit on, on the diagnostic stewardship side, what we have done. So I, here's where you really need to work with a multidisciplinary team. And, and that may include your, your you know, um, your your finance people, but also the emergency department and the laboratory. When we create our clinical decision support tools, we actually put you know, the short panel and the long panel, and we put a dollar sign. And that's sort of to remind our mm -hmm. providers, hey, this is a short panel, it's less expensive, this is a larger panel, and we call it also immunocompromised hosts. So if you have someone who's, like we mentioned, young child, immunocompromised, or any age, immunocompromised patient, if we do the short panel and then the short panel is negative, you're gonna end up doing the long panel. So it's actually for the payer, it's, it's double. You know, it's, you're, you're doing two tests. So w the way we think of this is we have someone immunocompromised that, you know, if you're immunocompetent and you end up having, you know, metanumovirus, you may not do anything. But if you're immunocompromised and you have metanumovirus, it may change. Uh, the outcomes. So we want to make sure that we reserve the extended panel for people who will really benefit from doing it, and that's the way I would approach it on the payers. You know, it, rational use of the test. If you can get the same information on the short panel, why are you going to spend so much more money or the extended one? So there may be times where it's appropriate to use the five, and I would think that you need to have a conversation and review, perhaps do some some review of which are the cases that are being denied and they were appropriately denied or inappropriately denied? Like, was it really necessary to do an extended panel or we would have gotten the same answer with a short panel? What do you think, Lily? Uh, so it's interesting, right? Because uh, as I was reviewing uh, these cases, um, I was gonna discuss this with uh, both of you. Um, what is the thought of, uh, in the situation, for instance, of that um, kidney transplant patient um, that uh, we're concerned about possibly having influenza or COVID or any other a viral or bacterial illness. Um, but in the emergency department, uh, is it possible to do actually the short multiplex testing, which comes back literally, possibly in 30 minutes, and then if that's negative, then to do the extended panel? Because if that's positive for influenza, that's my answer. I don't have to do any further. Yeah. And, 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 and if not, then we may then have to do the extended panel. The only panel. part is the inconvenience in the patient, because sometimes you have to re-swap, yep. you can't use Correct. the same swap. Like but I agree with you. I always say, if you can kill a mosquito, you don't need a bullet. You just kill a mosquito. <laughs> so moving on to the next Very question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you hear crackles and auscultation, is there a benefit doing a chest x-ray versus just treating? I, I like to I, I like to define pneumonia. Um, you know, some sometimes there there could be other things going on, and, and if your patient doesn't do well, you'll be very happy you got an initial film. Um, so uh, so yeah, I, I generally would if if I'm hearing something that wasn't there before, I usually will err on the side of caution or a chest X-ray, and of course, order antibiotics for them at the same time. So. Okay. The next question. Hello. If COVID antigen is negative, do you? treat with antivirals even without flu testing? That's 
that's an interesting mm. one. Uh, so no, uh, yeah, the, the recommendations, um, Lily put it exactly right. So you, you need a positive test to, uh, to use um, anti-SARS-CoV-2. Well, and the COVID can... antigen may not have a very high, depends on what's circulating in the community. That's true, well, right? you could retest, right? So yeah. Right, you know, well, the yeah, recommendations to retest, yeah, right? Yeah, so, but presumptive, and retest with a PCR test, right. obviously, with a very high sensitivity, but, uh, but yeah, presumptive treatment still wouldn't be appropriate. No. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and these are the cases where if you have a very, based on the clinical presentation, sometimes antigen is negative, but the PCR is positive, mm. and sometimes, Again, it's vice versa. So, okay, you may, um, we already talked a little bit about a procalcitonin, but um, I think one of the questions was, when would you add a CRP or a procalcitonin testing to guide antimicrobial prescribing? That's, that's really more your, you're seeing the sickies, <laughs> you know, the ones, so the ones who really So how do you that. add a procal or an I, I tell you, uh, procalcitonin has not been well um, taken by the emergency medicine community. So it has not been very helpful. We do look at inflammatory markers because we know that inflammatory markers can guide severity of illness in the presentation of uh, COVID, uh, influenza, and other illnesses. Uh, so we do do that, but not procalcitonin. So I'll share an anecdote. Um, my six-month-old niece was recently hospitalized. Um, my brother lives in, in Colombia, in Bogota. And my niece uh, was actually admitted with what started like a little cold, ended up being severe RSV, ended up uh, in the pediatric ICU on BiPAP. Uh, fortunately, she did not get intubated. Um, but at some point um, when you know she was hypoxic and knowing, doing so great, the clinicians went and ordered a procalcitonin and they said, well, maybe she has an overimposed bacterial infection and the procal was negative. So I do think in, se in those settings, when you have a more complicated infection, it may help say, hey, no, this is all viral. We don't need to add antibiotic therapy. In someone presenting relatively with an upper respiratory infection, I, I tend not to use procalcitonin. I would reserve it more for a lower respiratory disease when you don't know if there is an overimposed bacterial infection mm -hmm. or if there is some sort of like septic like picture yeah. sometimes when we don't really know uh, but in most of the patients that you will see in your clinic I don't think a procalcitonin will have that much of a value uh, you know especially upper respiratory for lower respiratory it may or may not help okay um, when there are no positive results after an exhaustive round of multiple tests multiplex respiratory panels sputums the patient is still sick when is it appropriate to look at fungal infections and test for fungal infections, um, especially if they have recurrent infections in the last 12 months? Uh, yeah, look at the context. Uh, is the patient immunosuppressed? Um, are they, you know, from, you know, I also think about tuberculosis, other, mm. other atypical infections. So it's, it's good you start broadening uh, your view. Um, also think about, because uh, this just came, my personal anecdote is my nephew, uh, I, saw, I saw last weekend, he had a cough for, uh, for four weeks, and um, I said, it kind of sounds like he might have asthma, and so he's mm. getting tested because he did a peak flow and it was terrible. Um, so I've, I have a feeling he's going to go back. So, so start, start broadening. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think, and, that's, and this is actually where you want to involve an infectious disease um, expert. So this is one where you can explain that we've done the workup. You did, you did lab work. I mean, gosh, with a bunch of eosinophils on the exam, that could be a clue of a fungal infection. Um, any kind of exposure, what kind of work they do. You, you work that all through. And then it's, and you're still searching and you know, imaging everything else. That's when you hand off to an infectious and, and ask them. And this is a good one. I don't know if you have e-consults available, but we do. Um, you know, really helpful because it, it's just kind of processing all that data. What are my next best steps? Um, I would, I would think that would be a good way to go. Well, it's interesting, right? Because we also see this often presented to the ED. You know, months and months of cough, and they're well appearing. So, I mean, could it be a reflux? Uh, could it be uh, the yeah. uh, ACE inhibitor, you know? Yeah. I mean, these are other considerations. Uh, like it really depends on how the patient is presenting, whether they have a lot of comorbidities. Uh, and frankly, if they are concerned for fungal infection, again, we also hand it off to the infectious disease specialist. <laughs> so, so I think one of the key things is what I still teach our medical students and residents is the value of a good medical history continues yeah. to be priceless. You can order the most expensive test, but get a good history, exactly what you said. What do you do occupationally? Do you work in construction? Are right. you exposed to high levels of dust? Allergy, allergies, medications, you know, mm -hmm. a travel history. There are so yep. many other risk factors mm -hmm. that we need to take into consideration. I would not just jump and order up, you know, a galactomanan or an aspergillus PCR on everyone. 
Um, and then within fungal infections, depends where do you live geographically, right? It could be histoplasma, it could be coxy, uh, depending if you're in the valley. Um, or if you are, you know, in, in other regions, it could be allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So I think the, in, the immune status, the host, and the epidemiological factors will guide you when it's appropriate to add additional fungal testing. And in some cases, it may be completely appropriate. In other cases, it could be an atypical mycobacteria. Uh, in other cases, we're seeing patients that are smoking marijuana, which is, you know, one of the risk factors for seeing more fungal infections. Mm -hmm. So I do think uh, knowing the, the history and understanding the epidemiology will guide you when to order up additional tests. And yes, absolutely consult with an ID specialist to make sure that we guide the diagnosis and treatment. We are always here to help you. In a rural setting, uh, the access to outside testing is usually very limited. How accurate is this process in dealing with respiratory illnesses? And this is regarding how accurate is like using point of care? Do you have access to point of care? I don't know if this question came in online, but if you have access to point of care, then it's, it's going to be very accurate still. So you're yeah. not really gaining much in terms of accuracy uh, by, by using that extended panel in the lab. Um, so I, I think that I would feel good about the sensitivity uh, and certainly the specificity of, of that testing. So hopefully you can get that. And then, gosh, if you don't have that, I know it's, it's a real struggle with rural sites and limited, limited access to care. But um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't even know uh, how, to, how to respond to that kind of situation because it really is important. Uh, you know, you don't want your patient uh, getting sicker. You don't, you want to protect their family around them because if you have more at-risk patients getting, uh, getting ill, that's, that just increases the risk for, uh, for your whole community. So that's, that's a really tough situation. Um, the other question is, is it worth testing for influenza, RSV, and other viruses in healthy patients with low risk? I think we sort of cover that in, yeah. in, in the talk. Um, and I was going to mention this, you know, is, is there value uh, for epidemiology and public health reasons? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, again, you don't want to test it, but if it's symptomatic, even though we're not going to treat, would that be a valuable information? Um, and certainly, um, I can see that uh, in some cases it may be helpful, right? If the patient comes to the ED, we probably tend to overtest a little bit more, but we can see the trend uh, oftentimes, even before yeah. the Department of Health see the trend. And they may then guide us in our um, therapy uh, in our sicker patients, the people who are more at risk. Um, yeah, and the same thing if you have children or, or patients that are living in the dorms in a college, uh, right? That's, you know, we saw it with the influenza H1 and 1 epidemic. We saw it with SARS-CoV-2, very high transmission. Same thing in the jails. We mm -hmm. have very low thresholds sometimes mm -hmm. to test in the jails. We also cover the jails, Miami-Dade County. And that's, that's an area where you have 60 people living in the same mm -hmm. environment. So one gets infected, the transmission is very rapidly. Um, it, in terms of epidemiology, isolation, and avoiding further contagion to us is very important. Um, so those are specific settings. Same in nursing homes, very high risk mm -hmm. for transmission. It's impossible to keep a nursing home resident isolated in the room all the time when they have some yeah. shared spaces. Behavioral health hospitals, mm -hmm. also sometimes lo lower threshold for testing. But someone living at home, young, healthy, we may or may not test. Uh, if, if it's not going to change the management, knowing that the patient has a rhinovirus may not require testing. Uh, we only have a few seconds left, and I think um, the other question that they ask is, can upper respiratory infections be diagnosed via telemedicine? Chuck. Well, obviously, yeah, so we're doing it all the time, right? And so, and uh, during, the, during the height of the pandemic, if, when we switched to all telehealth, um, uh, you know, during, during lockdown, um, that's exactly what we had to do. And we learned a lot of ra workarounds and things like that, but it's still, there were, there were multiple moments then, even now, where it's like, gosh, I wish, I wish you were in front of me, unless they happen to have an antigen test um, you know, and, and other, other tech that we can use, because it definitely has existed for a long time. Telehealth was, was, they were trying to start up for two decades at least uh, before the pandemic, and it just, uh, the pandemic just accelerated it finally forward. So, yeah, it's, it's, I think there's a lot of hope for, uh, for the future in that. Well, uh, it has been really an honor to share the podium with both of you. I, I learned a lot, and I really want to thank each and every one of you yeah. for participating. Yeah, great, thank great you. Questions. Thank you. Please earn your CMEs uh, by clicking the icon or using the, the QR code, and share your feedback. What can we do to improve? And I hope you learned something new today, and we all kept you awake. So <laughs> yeah. thank you, and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.